Wow, it's 5.25, so many people. Thank you for joining us. I hope we will make your time here worth it. I promise we will not sell anything. We will just share our experience. My name is Yasen Simeonov and I'm product manager at Intuit uh, in the looking after the developer experience and I'm more focused on the service mesh and API gateway. And yeah, Henrik. Hi everyone, my name is Henrik Blixt. Uh, I'm also a product manager at Intuit and I'm also one of the, the Argo maintainers. So we're quickly today gonna talk a little bit about um, how we use service mesh and how we looked at Intuit. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about progressive delivery, why we use it, how we use it, and then I'm gonna talk about how well they work together or how well they didn't work together and we kind of what we experienced and realized as we tried to use these together. A little bit look into the future, what we think is coming next, what are the big focus areas for us, and then we're gonna round off with uh, Yasin doing a live demo. Yeah. So uh, very quickly uh, about Intuit, since we're in Europe, not too many of you probably know who we are because we have 95% of our business in, in the US. But we're one of the leading US fintech companies. We have roughly $10 billion in, in revenue. Um, what you probably know us more for, um, if you knew, is that our, the Argo project came out of Intuit, where it came out of a startup that we acquired, uh, and then we later donated uh, Argo to the CNCF. We're big supporters of open source, not just Argo, but there are a number of other projects that we contribute to that we use. Basically, if it's in the CNCF, you've probably all seen that massive map, right? If it's on that map, we pretty much use it. Uh, and we contribute to many of them uh, as well. Um, I'll hand okay, my you. turn. Yeah, before going to this slide, I just, out of curiosity, how many of you are here because of the service mesh part? Can, how? Okay. Great. Yeah, great. And how many because of uh, the progressive delivery and Targo? Whoa, great. Okay, excellent. I think this slide uh, shows our scale and it is important for the service mesh part because uh, you can see that we have around more than 230 uh, Kubernetes clusters and the service mesh that I'm going to talk about in a moment stretches across all those clusters. So we have one single mesh across all those clusters. REST is like uh, dynamic, so our uh, node count is growing depending on the period. We have some peak period where the count grows and some quiet period when, when the count goes down. Uh, yeah, so we have more than 7 million pods running in our infrastructure. Okay, so why service mesh? So we are a fintech company and uh, for us, it is very important, security is very important. So we have this zero trust uh, infrastructure. So in this particular example, service A cannot talk to service B without proper authentication and uh, authorization. So what we did in the past, we have this API gateway that you see on the top and service A cannot talk to service B, we apply Kubernetes network policy that uh, services can talk only to the API gateway. And this is where we apply uh, all the security, all the TLS, everything that, that is needed, and all advanced traffic management. However, on my slide, the API gateways are just a circle. However, just for your information, in the peak period, uh, we process more than a million transactions per second. So in reality, it is not just a circle. It is like a huge uh, set of replicas of the API gateway, uh, and yeah, it is a complex environment. With growing of the service mesh, uh, we figure out that for us, this is the right way to deal with the security and with the traffic management. And that's why uh, we started moving different services to the mesh. So uh, for the services, we uh, add this uh, Envoy proxy, and now the traffic can flow between the services directly from service A to service B without hooking to the API gateway. So when you see at this point, all services have two endpoints. The initial endpoint is the public endpoint through the API gateway, and service B has like service B.API.intuit.com, but service B now, because it is mesh enabled, has second endpoint, which is service B.mesh, for example. And the client of service B, in this particular example, service A, can decide, I want to call service B through the API gateway with the API service B.API.intuit.com or through the mesh. 
So this was a step from the migration. So when we, when we start switching the traffic and if the services don't need to be exposed outside of our network, for example, service B and service C in this example, they are just internal services and service A need to be exposed outside, we uh, offboard those services from the API gateway and now all service to service communication happens through the service mesh and uh, services that need external exposure are also onboarded to the API gateway. I think many of you uh, think that uh, the Envoy proxy at uh, latency. In our case, it is uh, completely opposite uh, because we don't have to hook the traffic to, it is a completely uh, different VPC, completely different account for the API gateway. Now the traffic stays either local in the cluster or goes directly from cluster to cluster. We see more than 30% latency improvement on the service to service communication. Again, in this particular example, the, the communication is MTLS encrypted. Uh, service A presents its identity to Service B, Service B presents its identity to Service A, and they establish this communication channel. Uh, so, the way that we implement the API gateway, it is front-ended by uh, AOB. This means this is a public network. So, by moving the traffic, the service-to-service -service traffic to, uh, through the service mesh, we keep the traffic in the private network. Uh, we significantly reduce our public cloud provider cost with this. Uh, and yeah, so one hop less for the communication. Also, uh, we were rotating certificates and keys for the services in order to communicate with the API gateway manually every 90 days. Right now, with service mesh, it is a matter of hours and it is fully automated, so developers don't have to rotate certificates and keys. Also, in the past, when the traffic goes uh, through the API gateway, the service owner can, can have observability from the API gateway to to their service. Right now, uh, we have transactional uh, visibility. We can see the entire chain from service A to service B to service C. We have this observability. So this is overall uh, our architecture. I will start from the bottom. So uh, in, in the Kubernetes spot, we push uh, the Envoy proxy. And we have one additional, uh, uh, one additional container, which is this third agent wrapper. Uh, in our case, uh, our certificates are, uh, the identity of the certificates are not SPIFI compliant, so we have different ways for the certificates. That's why we have our own implementation of the, of the certificate rotation, and we pull the certificate from our certificate authority. So this is for the, for the data path. For the control plane, uh, we have Istio D per cluster, so control plane per cluster, and uh, on the right side, you can see the certificate authority. We can see, you can see the Admiral, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. And of course, integration with Argo. So this is more central component, is to this per cluster. Just want to mention about uh, Admiral. Uh, if you remember, we have service A, service B, service C. Uh, however, those services may be in different uh, Kubernetes clusters. And if you remember, uh, we have uh, Istio D per cluster. So we have to find a way how to enable service discovery across the clusters. And Admiral is another uh, open source project uh, that uh, Intuit do, uh, donated to Istio ecosystem. Now with Istio going to CNCF, hopefully Admiral also will go to CNCF. And Admiral is responsible to synchronize the uh, endpoints to, to do service discovery across the clusters. Just uh, one example, uh, what we did initially for our developers, uh, we let them manu manually onboard their services to service mesh. Uh, they go to the dev portal, they click enable mesh, and we send them PRs uh, with the uh, Istio uh, label and their services on mesh. However, what we did recently, we made this day zero experience. If uh, our developers create a new service, we are not asking them. So the service to service communication always happens through the mesh. So API gateway is only for no, uh, external communication. Okay, that's it from it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yasin. So uh, just an interesting, how many in here know what progressive delivery is? Or is it half maybe? So. I'm going to give you a teaser on why progressive delivery is really cool, why we use it into it. If you want to know more about progressive delivery, please come by the, the Argo uh, booth over in the Project Pavilion, and me or one of the maintainers will be happy to give you 
as much detail as we'd possibly want. So one of the main reasons for using progressive delivery is, uh, at Intuit is that we're from the platform team. We build the developer experience platform for our 5,000 developers. So one of the main reasons for this is, is increasing operational excellence because we also run all the services you know, for all Intuit's uh, almost 100 million customers. Uh, so one thing that we do a lot is introduce change into the system. So this could be Someone does a configuration change, someone deploys a new version, someone deploys a brand new service. Every time you introduce change into the system, there is a chance that something might go wrong. When that happens, uh, we want to make sure that we minimize the impact from that change. By using progressive delivery, we can actually roll out you know, your new canary, your new stack to a subset of users, do some testing, increase the number of users that see that canary, we actually reduce you know, the blast radius from anything that might go wrong. Uh, the other one is when something happens, it takes a while, you know, something goes wrong, a user finds out, they call back, some developer gets woken up, and you, know, you start trying to troubleshoot what's going on, and then eventually figure out what the heck went wrong, and then you start fixing it, right? And that whole process, I think most of us have been through, that takes a while. Uh, and that just leads to the long MTTR, long mean time to recovery. So by using the automation that progressive delivery offers, we can increase the reliability of the process and also reduce the time because we can automate a lot of that. So if something happens during one of those steps, we just automatically roll back. So instead of put it, putting everything out there, wait until something happens and a user calls in, we'll just automatically run a bunch of tests. If they fail, boom, we roll back right away. So that just helps us troubleshoot or you don't even have to troubleshoot. It just gets us back to a known good state much faster. The other, one, the other thing we noticed when we talked to some of our developers was that they, they spend quite a lot of time figuring out if a change they made, if a release they did, is actually healthy. They build their own custom das dashboards. They look at logs. They look at other dashboards. And they just sit there babysitting their, their applications to make sure that they're actually good. And they spend a fair amount of time doing that. So by automating this process, building more reliability and dependability on this process, we can free up time for these developers so they don't have to babysit and make sure that everything is working because we're doing that automatically, right? So they can deploy, rest assured that the, the automated tests fill the function of the dashboards, and then they can you know, keep doing what they, they, they want to do, which is you know, coding rather than, than babysitting applications. So, as a surprise to no one here, probably, uh, we use Orgorolas for progressive delivery. And just like uh, Yasin mentioned for service mesh, we've made it a day zero experience. So when uh, a user comes in into a dev portal, creates a new service, they get automatically onboarded with Argo rollouts. Um, we still have a large number of services that were created before Argo rollouts. And for them, we have a, an opt-in migration experience that we built. So they, we're not forcing them to migrate, but there's a very simple, simple path to, to get there. Um, and of course, everything is, is stored in Git. Probably don't even have to, to mention that these days. And then rollouts, we deploy into all our 250, 260 clusters. And then it's managed by, by the Argo teams. And we've kind of divided it up in waves depending on the business units we have. So the business units, depending on how risk averse they are, might be in a later wave and we start, you know, wave one is pre-prod and then we soak there for a little bit and then we roll down, roll down the wave. So once we hit, you know, the, the really business critical ones, you know, we, we know that everything is, is working fine. Um, so this process and this getting service mesh and progressive delivery working together wasn't completely uh, free of challenges. So one thing we noted uh, initially, was that we need multiple traffic providers. And initially, Argo Rollas didn't support more than one traffic provider. So having east-west traffic and northwest traffic coming in, in into different, different paths uh, meant we couldn't really track metrics for our progressive delivery from two different, two different, uh, those two different paths. Once we fixed that in Argo Rollouts and actually now support that, we realized that it's, it's actually pretty hard to figure out what metrics to use, what aggregations to look at when you figure out the health of your application. So now we're actually, the goal is actually instead to, to make sure that we're using service mesh for everything. 
So even if this is actually a supported way in, in rollouts now, it actually makes it harder for the service team to figure out how, if you're using the HTTP request metrics, which one are actually the ones that, that tell me a better story of my application health. So we're looking at using service mesh for everything because then we have a single aggregation point through service mesh. Another thing we ran into was that we were using the Admiral tool that, that Yasser mentioned earlier, and it actually creates uh, the endpoints as an abstraction over the, the Kubernetes service names. Unfortunately, Argo rollouts depends on the Kubernetes service names. So that was something you know, we realized as we were starting to test this, like, hey, this, this is probably not uh, working, so we had to fix that. It's now fixed and, and working. Uh, um, how many in here think that migrations are fun? <laughs> okay, we have, we have five people that work for a migration tool company. Um, but we're now looking at two migrations here, right? We're talking about service mesh and progressive delivery. And we have 2,000 services that were there before we made this a day zero experience. And telling them to do not one migration, but two didn't really raise that much excitement. So we spent a lot of time, like, like Yasin said as well, making it a super simple experience. Like in a developer portal, there's a drop down. I don't know if you can see that, maybe the first two rows can, but for you guys in the back, there's a drop down that says enable mesh, and on the other, on the other one drop down says migrate to progressive delivery. So just by using, going into a dev portal, drop down, click, you can move your service over to progressive delivery or, or service mesh. Uh, we've also run a bunch of programs internally. We call them Fix It Day or Game Days, where we basically, you know, put up a challenge for the teams. The team that migrates the most services during a day, you know, they get they get a prize. You know, we do check checkpoints every hour and just kind of make it a competition and just encourage the, the teams to do this migration instead of coming in, you know, with a big hammer like Thou shall migrate. We're just trying you know, to to spur them to do it organically instead. Also, it's super important. Stopping the bleed. So the first thing we did was the day zero experience and then the migration to make sure that we're not just onboarding more services that we don't have to migrate. So let's let's stop the bleed first and then you know we can migrate what's what's left in the uh, in in the, the infrastructure. I already mentioned this a little bit, but configuring those analysis templates are actually it would actually be challenges, even for the service teams that, that know the services. Because we have a wide variety of services. Um, a lot of our software is, is tax preparation software. Uh, for some reason, people like to do their taxes two days before uh, tax filing deadline. So we, so we have some services that have a very strong seasonality. Uh, we have other services that are more uh, geared towards small business, so they run all year, but maybe peak around you know, Black Friday or not. So we have big differences between the traffic that comes into these services. Some have just the same amount of traffic all year. Some have almost all the traffic in two weeks, and then there's almost nothing. So if you want to do an HTTP-based request, HTTP request based analysis, how do you do that when you basically don't have any traffic in the service for, for three, three weeks, right? And, and so uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time with our teams to try and figure out what the, like the 80, 80 20, 90, 10 rule and figure out what, what's the best default that we can do, and then also make sure that when we, we create these templates uh, and clone them into the, the Git rope repos when they create the service, that's also an easy way for them to, to change those values in case they need to customize them with custom metrics or change the values that, that we provide. Uh, how are we doing time-wise? Um, so what's next? So some of the other things we're, we're looking at, uh, traffic mirroring is supported in service mesh. Uh, we have some services that don't even want to do progressive deliver at all. They want to make sure they do an apples to apples comparison. So traffic mirroring, traffic shadowing, traffic cloning, whatever you want to call it, basically doing a, a, a new path where you send off a certain amount of, of production traffic to a stack that, that your users aren't on, right? So that you can test those two stacks against each other without really affecting any users. So we're looking at how we can use that for, for Argo rollouts. Uh, Argo rollouts can do the canaries based on on pods and just do, do a weight basically, or we can do uh, percentage traffic, you know, 10% traffic scale up to 30 or not. But there are use cases where we want to do something a little bit smarter. You know, do it on maybe some people from a certain region or some that use a specific browser or whatever, go to the canary, right? So, so we're also looking at using header-based 
routing so we can be, do a little bit more intelligent canaries rather than just a percentage based of, of the traffic. And I think the biggest thing that we're, that we're really excited about is anomaly detection and observability. Because even if you have these analysis templates, we run these analysis before we do our progressive delivery, it's still you know, a fairly rudimentary measurement of just doing a metric, right? So what if we can do something a lot smarter than that? We have a lot of uh, data scientists. We do a lot of ML at, at Intuit. What if we can take all our, all our operational data and, and utilize some of all that ML knowledge we have and, and figure out something, a, a smarter way of, of measuring if, if the rollout is, is progressing the way it should, rather than just looking at you know, CPU usage, memory usage, or, or HTTP requests, which are still pretty, pretty crude, right? So if we can use ML to figure out an anomaly score or, or a good measure of, of how the application is doing, that's a much better way of, and will give engineers even you know, greater trust in the system if, if it's healthy or not. And you can take that even a step further. Why stop at, uh, at the progressive delivery? You know, if, if you can figure out when your application has an anomaly, why wouldn't you want to run that all the time? Right? It might not be part of the, the, the delivery process, but it might be something might happen once you've fully promoted to 100%. What about something happening two days down the line? Right? You would still want to, hey, something anomalous happened. I want to roll back. So that's also something that we're looking into. How can we, how can we not just make the, the rollout of a new version better, but also you know, increase the reliability and, and fault detection for the services that run in our system after we fully promoted the, the canary. And I think with that, we're going to switch over to, to a live demo. Great. Uh, other than uh, anomaly detection, my favorite is the header-based routing because you can do dark releases. So we can do, uh, during the tax filling, only Henrik's taxes to go through the new version, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we knew that there will be some interest, although, yeah, the room is like really full. We would like to entertain you a little bit with live demo. Hopefully, it will all work. Let me quickly show you what I have. in the demo. This will be probably slow. Let me explain what the application that I'm going to deploy. So people that are experienced with, uh, with Argo probably have seen such demo or have done this uh, for themselves, but I just want to uh, go through it one more time. So I have three nodes. And in the cluster, I have Argo rollouts, and I have uh, Istio uh, in a demo mode. And the Istio version is the latest one that I think is available right now, 13.3. I will go back to this in a moment. Meanwhile, I would like to show you the application that I'm going to deploy, very simple. So this is version one that I will deploy now initially, and version one just says hello Valencia, that's it. Uh, once this is done, I will, I will deploy version two, and I artificially added some errors. So uh, other than I added hello Valencia with an error, and actually I sent HTTP 500 status code. This means uh, Argo rollout need to figure out that something is wrong and throw back. And when it rolls back, hopefully, uh, I will deploy version 3, which is again healthy version. So the status code is 200, and the message should be hello Valencia from Intuit. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I will fix this. <laughs> so the Argo rollout version is again the latest one. I will create a namespace called kubecon. I will label it so to be enabled for Istio. Actually, let me, let me, I will run a curl that will print the body and the status code. So right now there is no application deployed, so it is 400. And I will deploy the first version. So the application responds to this uh, 
FQDN and I am deploying the first version. Okay, good catch. Can you send PR, please? <laughs> Okay, it takes some time. Yeah, this is the problem with the live demo. Uh, you cannot rely on the fluctuation in the internet speed. So, okay. So the first version is deployed. Let me see. Okay. So I have uh, the. I have two pods running, and you can see it is hello. Okay, the typo with 200 status code. So what I have in the row out here, uh, so you can see the strategy is Canary, and I want, I want dynamic analysis, and the Canary ver uh, service name is this one, and the stable service name is this one. And the progress will happen like this. 10% of the traffic will be directed to the Canary version. And we will wait for one minute to make analysis. Then if everything is good, we will progress to the 30%. We will wait for 30 seconds. Then the half of the traffic, we will wait for another 30 seconds. And you see that we are doing traffic router uh, routing with uh, Istio and we modify the virtual service. I will actually show you the virtual service in a moment. So I will deploy the second uh, version. Yeah, this is probably something that takes time. Please hold on, I'm sure it will happen. Ah, you can see, that, so now the new version is, uh, hello, Valencia with uh, status, with error and status code 500. So you can see the virtual service in Istio uh, right now has 90, wait 90 for the primary and 10 for the Canary version. And this is modified by the, by, by Argo rollouts. So now, if we watch here, um, my configuration is uh, to wait 60 seconds or one minute uh, before start the analysis. Right now, we have 43 seconds, 44, so it uh, should go to 30% in a second and start the analysis. You can see uh, from time to time, I'm, get, I'm getting this error. So, yeah, the analysis is just run, and uh, my configuration is uh, if uh, it needs to do to go three times, and uh, if the th three time it fails, uh, it will 
it will fail back on the fourth time and will go back to the original version of the application. Yeah. So now it is aborting back and uh, it will terminate this pod and you can see all the messages now going back to the original version with status code 200. And again, to show you the virtual service in Istio, so the, the wait for the new uh, version is zero and all the traffic goes to the original version. I will deploy now the healthy version 3. Hopefully it will take less time than earlier. So this one, if I go back here, you will see that this one sends status code HTTP 200, so it should be successful and it should uh, say hello, okay, Valenisa <laughs> from Intuit. <laughs> yeah. uh, I ran through the demo just before the session started and it wasn't that slow. So this probably will eat the time for questions, but we will stay longer and uh, we can chat after this. We have about three minutes left. Yeah, it's done. So this is the last version. <laughs> hey. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so this will progress in a moment to complete, but yeah, we can we can take questions now, I think. Yeah. Yes, and you're you're using Argo and Istio to keep uh, your application up to date. What are you using to keep Argo and Istio up to date? Yeah, so we are using Cargo CD to use this uh, up to date. So we go 100% GitOps. So our, all our configuration is in GitOps, and Cargo CD synchronizes uh, the configuration for those tools. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Question up. Yep. Yeah. Question up. I, I will repeat the question. Uh, why are you? Ah. Yeah, because uh, if I add one more component here, it will take uh, more time. So if I add, add Argo CD and send PRs to GitHub, it will add one more component that can add latency. So I, I just wanted to focus on Argo rollouts and service mesh. Otherwise, in reality, we are using Argo CD, yes. Yeah. Yeah, another question down there? Yeah. So, so uh, I, have, I have a question. Um, right now, we, um, we look at the uh, HTTP status code, right? And if it's not 200, we roll it back. And uh, is that possible to look at some other metrics like uh, Kafka, QNANS, or some business metrics, like payments, success rates? I mean, you, for, so for the, for, for the analysis templates, you can basically use an, anything that can be served as a metrics. I mean, we, we, we go to Prometheus, so basically anything that you can serve as a metrics through Prometheus you can use to base your analysis templates on. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, great. Uh, does your service mesh cross uh, like VPC boundaries or cloud boundaries? Uh, and if so, like how are you managing that like cross VPC, cross cloud connection? That's correct. We have uh, Kubernetes cluster per VPC or EKS cluster per VPC and uh, we have also Istio D instance per VPC. However, it is the same mesh across all clusters. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think uh, under the mesh we are using uh, transit gateway for connecting different VPCs. And actually, this succeeded. <laughs> Eventually. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Thank you. There was, yeah. Do you have time for one final question? Yeah. I still so have audio, so let's do one more. You use Argo CD to deploy, to deploy Argo rollouts, but what do you use to deploy Argo CD and Argo, keep it up to date? Argo CD. 
and <laughs> what to do with the brakes. So we, so we have, so we have, uh, we have a number of Argo CDs. Like basically, what each one of our business entities has their own Argo CD, and then we have an Argo CD that manages the, the other Argo CDs. So uh, what's what's the initial Argo CD? How do you deploy it? How do you deploy zero zero day Argo CD? <laughs> Sorry. Like. Who is the first? <laughs> <laughs> what is the first Argo CD is the question, right? <laughs> yeah, so the, he, he means when you first bootstrap the first ever Argo CD, how do you go about uh, doing the first one? So the, when we started Argo, when we did the very first one? Yeah, uh, yeah like the, the bootstrap Argo CD that you use to deploy other Argo CD clusters. Yeah, so, so that one has been there for a while, and I, I, I wasn't there when that was done, but I, I assume that was done manually. I, I don't know, to be honest. Actually, <laughs> yeah, we have, we have Argo CD as an add-on for the EKS cluster. So when you deploy the Kubernetes cluster, it goes pre-built with Argo CD. And all the services that you deploy in this cluster already rely on the Argo CD cluster. With the, with, so it is add-on in the Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, so for, okay. so for new clusters, it's, it gets, uh, yeah, it's part of the bootstrap. But the original one is okay, old. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.